So it's three really different people with really different backgrounds. So I'm looking forward to getting a bunch of different perspectives on both the creative side of where we are in the video space and also the technological side of where we are in the video space. Um, and a little stat to kind of get us started, while I was doing research for this panel, something that came up was that as of 2020, there's 108 million households in the United States that are consuming streaming media each year. So that's households, that's not individuals. That's an astonishing amount of people who are now in the streaming space. And that's not necessarily live, and so we're not necessarily gonna have quite the same interactivity level on that, but it's a really staggering number nevertheless. And when you start getting into the details of this, we're also seeing the explosion of different platforms. So it's not just watching streaming through your TV, it's going into the mobile space, it's watching on other devices. Um, and a quote, which I wish I could remember where I saw this, but it just stuck in my head, is primetime is now personal. And so along with this explosion of content, there's this sense of diversification. Um, and everyone can kind of tailor their experience in different ways. And one of the things I'd like to start with you, Noam, about is you have kind of a traditional production background. Um, you were a writer. And how have you seen the space change over the course of your career, particularly now that you're doing more work in the live space? Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting. And I know when you and I first um, started talking, I had shared that, you know, I have I realized, I think, at a certain point in my career that I was never going to be the greatest traditional filmmaker, but the intersection of um, new technology and storytelling has been a paradigm that I've always been fascinated in. So, you know, back, I used to run um, the digital media arm of Peter Gruber's company, Mandalay Entertainment, and that was literally in the early aughts, so Web 1.0. And it was interesting seeing that at the time there was great sort of aspiration for the intersection of what storytelling would look like on new platforms and new ways of accessing audiences, but the technology didn't necessarily at the time live up to the promise. So fast forward to today, and what's particularly exciting, I think, as you said, not only is primetime personal, but there's also a, a democratization of how people have the platforms by which to tell their stories. There are no gatekeepers. Um, and I think if in particular what has really stood out is that the pandemic sort of changed the paradigm of doing things in real time. That there was a, a real opportunity to experiment with what live meant and how people could have an immediate connection. So what's been particularly exciting for me over the last couple of years is going from filming things and creating things that you had time to sort of shape and form and make look as good as they can to sort of the planning and strategy around what live would look like. Awesome. I'm going to skip Duke for a sec because I, I want to come back to you as a, a sort of button on the end of this first round of questions and go to Michelle. And Michelle, we've known each other for a long time at this point. Since 2003. 2003. We interned um, together somewhere. <laughs> we did. Um, but what I think is interesting about your career is that you've moved from a uh, live production standpoint and doing in-person events and kind of work in that space to um, starting, I think, before the pandemic, but definitely much more in the pandemic, working in the live digital space. So how have you seen that transition and um, what skills have you kind of taken from one discipline to another? Uh, what are the challenges that you've seen in that space? Discuss. Um, so yeah, in my past life, I was an event producer for like doing activations at New York Comic Con, uh, San Diego Comic Con, Anime Expo, you name it, I was there doing some big thing with like food and drinks for fans and um, that was my bread and butter and then the pandemic ha hit and I was like, okay, I'm not doing any of that anymore. <laughs> um, so then from a live aspect, um, I joined on with Esports Engine. They do, their primary client is Switch and um, we do shows on uh, slash uh, Twitch uh, gaming. So there is uh, a lot of stuff there happening with once there is a live event like um, E3, uh, they have a, a follow-up show that's live talking about um, people's reactions to it, uh, the fans, uh, like everyone's reactions basically, the reaction show. Um, but for, for framing that into like an hour long or two hour long production that's live and happening like right after the show. Um, so doing that production is, it's very similar to like, late night or how you hear like they build like SNL. So you have all these live portions where there's reactions, things go terribly wrong, there's scripts, no one reads them. Um, <laughs> like people in the back, like, you know, those cameras falling over and stuff. Welcome but to working with Twitch people. It's, it's wild, but no, I'm not, I'm not blaming them. But, um, but um, 
there's also portions that are pre-produced, of course, that we have little segments that we um, re-roll in between to get things set up and switch between locations. And um, the primary like, goal of those is to have people in chat interacting, as well as having other Twitch streamers co-streaming um, at the same time and showing like their perspective of that event. So um, one thing that we did kind of recently, well, no, it was in the summer. It's not recent. Um, it was called Twitch Gathering. It was right after E3. Uh, during E3, and um, in this event, we had uh, robots <clears throat> that are designed for, uh, I guess, like doctors to talk to patients that they can't see physically. Like they, they roll around, they have like an iPad attached to a stick, um, and <laughs> we had streamers log into those robots and then walk around uh, a live event space and talk to the only two people who were on the site were two co-hosts and then the crew, of course, which we tried to stay off camera. And then we had like activities for them to do, like QR codes they could scan to win prizes and um, like a, ra a racetrack so they could race other robots uh, to go up and down. Uh, and so basically we tried to form a live event into a digital space with robots, a minimal team on site, and um, also Twitch uh, chat interacting and having them like have some say in um, like what events happen next or what the host will talk about and sort of balancing production and pre-planning and like off the graphics and our whole crew with like what does what does chat want us to do has been pretty wild um and i think it's it's sort of the way that model is sort of the way um live production is going that anyone from anywhere online can help like shape your show um, kind of segueing a little bit from that or digging deeper into it, um, your experience working in sort of live events and how you engaged audiences for those, do you feel like that's transferred over to some extent to what you're doing in the digital space? Do audiences behave differently in person versus online in your experience? What's, what's the way, I mean, we know that like online conversation can obviously be a cesspool at times, <laughs> but um, you know, what, what do you think is uh, something that you've learned in the real world space that has transferred well to the live space, the live digital? Um, just the simple thing of making the audience feel engaged um, in a live event would be things like giveaways, uh, contests, raffles, um, like hosts doing Q&A, that kind of thing. All of that transfers to uh, in a digital event um, that, we, that we've been able to figure out, um, except that, of course, you're not actually seeing them live. So you need to have, in the production side of it, it's been important for us to make everything look super clean which is incredibly hard to do live, as everyone here knows probably. Um, but basically, we're trying to amp up like how exciting it is for someone to, like I mentioned before, like win a robot race. Like we're, you know, we're live on site and we can see these robots like falling off tracks, and we're trying to pick them up. And it's not very glamorous, but like when you're showing it on camera, <laughs> we're just trying to like you know em emphasize that the ridiculousness of it, the live aspect of it, is like so exciting, and that you are because you can interact with people who are not in your town. Um, that is another thing that is, I guess, more amplified for people. But I think, like the human, the very human part of all of us, like we want to talk and see people in person, no matter what we <laughs> say. Um, and I think that aspect of I've been seeing more events happening recently. I've been doing a couple conventions already this uh, month um, or last month, and um, that feeling of going back to those sorts of events is definitely here. So there, at some point, you know, the live events will be great for people who want to interact who are not all in the same like physical space. But live events aren't going to go away. Mm -hmm. So Duke, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you do and kind of the backbone connective tissue that makes all of this happen. And your deep background is that you were in the early days of Hulu, I think yep. you said. And so how have you seen the growth of the streaming space and what is going on behind the scenes in order to do things like having these live remote productions? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the, the landscape has changed quite dramatically, um, especially even during COVID. And uh, you recall, I forward you the white papers that I co-author, um, part of the ETC. I don't know if you guys are familiar with ETC, the Entertainment Technology Center. So they approached us about a year and a half ago uh, when COVID hit. And our production, all of our customers, uh, you know, I came from Disney and I work with a lot of major studios. So basically, our production is halted. So the name of the game is how, and, and, and if you look at Hulu, Disney streaming services, there was a, hot, a lot of net new content, right, at the time. Um, you know, versus during, you know, during the financial crisis, a lot of people go to the movies. Uh, but this time is actually dramatic impact the, the studio in general, everyone, from content creators to broadcast industries, straight across. So we participated in this virtual production set. 
Uh, that was one of the first kind at the time. It was like a year and a half ago. Since then, since that first virtual set that we did, it's about 130 now that have been popping up all of the countries. So using LEDs walls, LED screens, you know, Mandalorian is a perfect example of that, right? Because, and then the white paper is about 150 pages. It's light reading, you know, before bedtime. Uh, basically encompass everything from COVID mitigations. We had a physician on site, you know, how do we move human uh, in, a, in a similar workflow in sequence without having people going back and forth. Uh, using robotics to control the cameras, like uh, fifth kind, things like that. And then more importantly, to get the dailies from on set into the editors, into the creative people, so they can start collaborating, right? So before, you know, you go into any of the lot, you know, there's edit bays, and it's all fiber attached and vice versa. So I'm an infrastructure guy. So I enable you guys to do your job, right? So we provide the plumbing. Um, so that's exactly what we did. We enable last mile connectivity. So wherever the set is, instead of sniggernetting content on HDCAM, SDCAM tapes to the, the post editors, we figure out a lot of different ways to simplify that process to enable the, the editors collaboration. An editor, uh, one of the use cases, we have an editor in New York, we have an editor in LA, we had an editor in Sydney. So how do they come together and collaborate? And for those who are not familiar with Equinix, um, we, provide, we have over 230 data centers globally. We provide the backbone to everywhere. So with that being said, that's with enablement for the ecosystem to come in, the content creator, the broadcasters, um, the linear space. So talking about, you know, because I built out, I, I came from, I, I was number 13 at Hulu. So I built out the whole entire platform. Back then is that in order for me to build out LA and then build out another location, because the objective is to reach you guys, the consumer, right? How do we get that content from LA to the East Coast people? So there's the whole supply chain. There's the transcoding, uh, be able to support what we call adaptive bit rate. The platform have to be able, so we have different rendition for various devices. Back then, TV and laptop, right? Now, you have iPhone, various devices, iPhone 4 or 5, God knows. It's like I talked to someone who still have an iPhone 6. <laughs> so you have to be able to support that aspect ratio for that device. So, so now, you know, and you know, the linear space, the traditional MVPD, is bridging the gap. And the perfect example of that, if you have YouTube TV, you can watch live events, right? How do we bridge that from live events, which are linear cameras, and then being able to convert that and then deliver it over OTT platform? So that's where we kind of come in to enable that for the, for the content creators, the broadcasters, and enable the creator to continue to do what they do best because, and we need more of that now than ever before. And given the fact with COVID, you know, it's like certain part of the country is not doing so well. So we still have to enable uh, content creator to be on site, on location, to minimize some of those uh, steps uh, so they can actually move forward and create new, net new content. So I'd like to kind of circle it into audiences a bit and audience engagement and kind of going back to you, Noam, uh, in the early days of quarantine, uh, you started a new initiative that was taking advantage of everyone kind of being online and at home again. So I'd love to kind of talk to you about, uh, describe what that was and then how you found people responded to it and what you kind of learned about audiences from that. Sure. Um, so a big part of what we started early on was recognizing that there was a particular community of people who were especially vulnerable during the pandemic, and that was seniors. Um, and we all know seniors. We all have parents and grandparents. Um, and these were people who were um, disproportionately impacted not only through health outcomes, but through mental health outcomes as well. Um, and we started a program called Dispatches from Quarantine that essentially invited people to reach out to their loved ones. We gave them sort of basic um, 
easy uh, alternatives for how to film them. If it was Zoom, if it was how you record a FaceTime screen and the like. And we said, send us that content and we'll create programming that celebrates sort of seniors and raises money towards ways that they can be supported. Now, that's great. But to augment that, we said, just like everything else in our media culture, celebrities will sort of really make a difference. So we were able to get names who uh, sadly are no longer with us, like Larry King, like Carl Reiner, who we actually spoke to four weeks before he died. He was the last person who agreed to do an interview with us. Ellen Burstyn, Tommy Chong, Norman Lear, Marla Gibbs, um, Marion Ross. And I think that the core idea there was this was a unique time in terms of creating content where people were accessible and open to conversations in ways that they wouldn't. And we sort of thought of this as an opportunity as to say, well, Right now, there was a brief moment during the pandemic when we were all mostly decent to one another and worried about how to how to look after those who were particularly vulnerable during the early days. And this seemed like something that people could galvanize around. So we had an audience of people who wanted heartwarming, uplifting content. We had a clear mission and edict and very simple instructions by which kind of the community that we were reaching out to could create content, share it with us, and together with the quote unquote more premium celebrity focused content created this ecosystem of programming um, you know, that generated millions upon millions of views, media impressions and everything from CNN to Time Magazine to um, the Washington Post and, and it was sort of great. And we wanted to sort of do an international initiative but that obviously had some of its own challenges so that was it. I think one of the things you used to, the term you used to describe this to me was audience created programming. And I, I really love that idea of, this is where audience engagement really comes in, is the idea of the audience participating in that process. And it's something that, you know, I see with kind of my live work, and I'm sure that Michelle also kind of in the Twitch space sees with your live work, is that kind of back and forth between creator and audience. At the same time, though, you don't want to let the audience dictate it entirely. Because I think you always want to be surprising audiences and coming up with something that they don't expect and that they're not kind of uh, already primed for. Um, so kind of how do you find those, those sweet spots of what's the right amount of engagement? Um, when does too much engagement become off-putting? How can you give audience control over certain things without letting it just completely go off the rails? Uh, Michelle. <laughs> well, um, so... Okay, talking from, I guess, the Twitch space, The again, this is official Twitch channels, not individual creators. Um, for the shows that we do for uh, uh, Twitch gaming, those shows are pretty structured to have a portion that's just for audiences to, like, say their mind, to have, um, we'll fly on screen um, the actual, like, chat comments, um, like, so-and-so says, like, whoa, what a cool idea, and we'll throw it up, and then that way they host see it, they talk about it, we'll feed them um, through their teleprompter, um, things that the chat are talking about. Um, but we have designated parts for that because otherwise it would just be chaos and the timing would be all crazy and we'd never get to the guests. So um, in that way, it does have to be controlled because when you're talking about a stream with like, you know, like 100,000 people watching, you're gonna get a lot of weird stuff happening um, in chat. You don't necessarily want to see, have talent see all that stuff because it gets a little overwhelming. Um, but that said, um, you know, uh, talking from my other line of work, which is, um, if you're not familiar, familiar with the tabletop RPG space, it's like Dungeons and Dragons, but we stream it online. It's like three hours of like playing and improv, and it's like real fun, and um, it's, a really, it's, it's a really niche market that's doing really well if you've heard of Critical Role. Um, that's a show I've been on before, too. Um, but in some of those shows, what they do for uh, audience interactivity, um, there's new um, widgets available, which are the little things. When you scroll down on a Twitch stream, you see below like their information, their profile, their schedule, and then they, there's something you can add in. Um, that is like a program called Scry. And we've been using Scry a lot, S-C-R-Y, I believe. Um, it's a way for the audience to buy stuff for, they, they buy not using money, they buy it using points they accumulate by watching the stream over like, over time, like, you know, 10 minutes is like 10 points. They use five points to buy, um, okay, we want this kind of monster to appear, or we want like um, this character to get this thing or lose this thing. So in that way, they're interacting with the story, but they're not like, taking complete control, because then um, the person in charge of looking at that, they can say, okay, the audience just bought um, this gate to open. Let's see what happens. It's not necessarily good or bad, or having the audience 
like completely destroy like the narrative of what's happening on on camera but it's more like it's we've planned for this <laughs> outcome he's one of 10 outcomes they picked this one so now we're going to go with that so pre-plan is a lot more pre-planning but i think having that um that modicum of um audience participation as opposed to a show that's just we're just broadcasting and yeah we're live but like you can't really talk to the the, the cast and you know it's not as fun um, and I think uh, a lot of shows on Twitch have started to do that. They started just be, like putting chat on like emote only, and that that, that that takes away for from what the point of live show be, having a live show is. Um, but yeah, there's a really careful balance I think of let the audience talk to you a little bit, don't let them take over the whole conversation. And um, yeah, we're also in a time where uh, Twitch is having a hard time with. Uh, Raids, if you guys are familiar with the hate raids thing. It's so a challenge. It's still yeah, happening. The, the internet can be rough. And that's yeah. I think that's something that all of us deal with is is how to funnel all of the energy and creativity into something that's still going to be a safe and productive space. Yeah. Um, Noam, I'd like to kind of talk to you a little bit more about that as well, is what's sort of your experience engaging with audiences in the live digital space and kind of how do you balance that, particularly as someone who has such a deep creative background, uh, with having a vision that you have while also trying to kind of add that participatory side? Um, I, I'd love to answer that by way of a quick anecdote. So I started working in the traditional TV one-hour drama space a lifetime ago. When I was 19, I was an assistant on a show and then became a writer on the show. And this was obviously in the days before the instant reaction of fans expressing their displeasure on social media when an episode airs and, and the broader discussion and frankly important discussion about how our media reflects kind of social constructs and, and where there's room for improvement. People who I know who write for TV today have to deal with that. It's almost like the fans are in the writer have an expectation of being in the writer's room. So I share all that simply to say that I think as Michelle pointed out, one of the things we're particularly mindful of when it comes to kind of live entertainment and the juxtaposition between how much is enough and how much is too much um, is remembering that you still have to have a plan in advance. That, that if there's opportunities for audience engagement, audience generated content, um, that has to fit into a larger strategy because otherwise ultimately chaos will reign. Um, the organization that I work for is supported uh, amongst other benefactors by Steven Spielberg's Righteous Persons Foundation, which means that we do a lot of things that sort of speak to the Jewish community. Um, and as you pointed out with these raids, whether it was programming we've done on Twitch or on Zoom or elsewhere, we had people come in who were virulently anti-Semitic um, and created an environment where people did not feel safe. So first and foremost, anyone who is wanting to create in this space, safeguards are critical. Um, how, you, how you manage uh, and blacklist certain words, how you have a moderation team that's very thoughtful about what, where there's a line and when that line is crossed. But at the end of the day, look, I think some of the things that ultimately sort of feel like a checklist, quizzes, prize, uh, uh, prizing, interactivity, those are all great, but I think what people want is to feel like they're a part of a discussion, part of a community, like to the ex you create a way in which they feel like their input is meaningful, even if you have in fact created safeguards to ensure that it doesn't go completely awry. Can you kind of give me an example of what sort of you find is meaningful content? What, what do audiences really react to? I think right now people, uh, I'm going to say something a little strange, it, it feels like the Ted Lasso effect, not the Squid Game effect, which is, I think people want to feel good. Uh, they they, they want to know that, um, so for example, um, the Jewish holiday of Passover, when the pandemic first began, people came to realize that they couldn't gather in their homes with their families, so we have some people who are in our member organization who are big Broadway stars, and we created Saturday Night Seder, which was a, a live variety show that had some of the biggest names on Broadway who were Jewish and not Jewish, and it was like, come be a part of this extended family. Community matters, and at a time where um, people feel very free to get online and feel however they want to feel and be offended or say things that are 
inappropriate that they wouldn't say to someone in the real world. Um, we found that creating content that really celebrated community, that emphasized diversity, um, were things that people responded to. So that ran the gamut from programming like that to programming like Dispatches from Quarantine to uh, an initiative we did, an all-night festival in the spring called Dawn. It was 12 hours of programming across three channels. So we programmed 36 hours live content. Um, that was insane. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it again. Um, and then lastly, uh, just to wrap up, um, we have gotten in the habit of acquiring public domain silent films and rescoring them with contemporary artists. So we did it with Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments last year and got some great recognition from that. Did it this year just in time for Halloween, the OG monster horror film The Golem and broke it down into eight parts. Each part was scored, and then the final part, I didn't even mention this to you, um, uh, we actually did a lot, with the musicians scored it live. Oh, cool. Um, and, and trying to figure out the mechanism to address different musicians in different locations, the inherent latency of delivery over a live stream while the film is playing presented some unique challenges, but it was very exciting to do. I think that's a really great point about how sort of creating positive content, creating a positive space tends to sort of reinforce positive behavior. So my, my experience on that was this is 2018, Stephen Calcote there and I uh, did a live stream narrative science fiction series that had audience interactivity built into it. And that meant that the audience could choose names for characters. They could choose lines for characters to say. They could choose which death-defying situation the characters would be in at different times. And it was all pre-planned. It had always been rehearsed. So exactly what Michelle was saying is like, you make a plan, you make the rails, and then stuff happens inside of that. And I expected the audience to be trolls. I expected them to, you know, make things harder for our characters and to really try and, and force them into tight situations. And we found that over the course of the eight weeks, um, I think because of the sort of positive nature of the story and because of what Stephen was trying to tell about kind of hard work and humanity, people were really inspired by it and started to be genuinely concerned about the fate of their heroes and stopped kind of making the troll questions and start to make the choices that they thought were going to help them. Um, and that was really inspiring to me. Like, I didn't honestly expect that, and I loved seeing it. Um, I wanted to go back to you, though, Duke. So going from kind of the, the streaming uh, situation with, with Hulu back in the day, to which is uh, video on demand, to the live space, how do you think audiences have changed from your perspective? Oh my god, it's just accessibility, uh, for starter, especially now, um, have been generated, you know, and I, I came from the, the, I also work in the broadcast world too. So prior to joining Equinix, like I said, I was Comcast. We managed over 10,000 channels. And that's just Comcast alone, right? And we're talking about all the you know, syndication partners globally. Now, traditional TV, you know, it's like, but if you think about it, everything is through OTT platform now. So a lot of that stuff is bridging the gap. So if you guys are familiar with you know, 2110, 2022-6, those are simply standards that enable traditional broadcaster to convert that linear content to, to your OTT platform, which support what we call HLS uh, or Dash. So things like if you want to use your browser, for example, to stream it, you can, right? Your iPhone. So for every content that gets created, there's, there's different uh, rendition to support various devices. So, and you saw the iPhone 13 now, and I was telling my colleague, I was specking that out, full HDR, 4K, 60, 60 frames per second. So because of that, the demand for net new content have been, have been going through the roof. And the traffic that going through our data centers is, is massive too, because anytime you're connecting to, you know, um, any of the OTT platform, right, Hulu, Netflix, Disney streaming services, very likely you're going through our data centers. Uh, and then obviously getting content one to many globally. Uh, and the objective is to reach the consumer as much as possible globally. And then on the other part is that it's one thing to get the content to the consumer, um, but the quality of the content, what we call uh, 
video quality measurement, right, using structure similarity, VMAP, which Netflix is part of the algorithm to look at how the video are being viewed in terms of the quality, uh, looking at the MOS scores. So we, the way we approach it is that we look at the consumer and work our way backwards, right? How the, what are the viewing habits from the consumer and the quality of the content and has to change? Is it good enough? So example, from a business perspective, if you have like a triple play from your cable provider, right? And you only buy 250 meg of internet services and you decide, hey, I'm gonna cut the core, I don't need the set-top box. And how many devices do you have at home? iPhone, iPad, computer, three smart TVs. All those content have to be able to support all those devices that you guys are viewing. Because what we call the human visualization system, it depends how you view it back and forth. And the distance and the pixelation, how you look at it. So because of that, more and more rendition are being supported today. So typically before, uh, you know, the encoders handle one source from a live event and it'll provide maybe six output, 1080p, uh, 720, a 640, or 480 and vice versa, right? Now with HDR, you have high dynamic range, you have Dolby Atmos, you have all these content that are available to the consumer. So, and the consumer always want the best quality of content. So if they click on it and you have blackout, you have graininess, you have jitter, they're going to go elsewhere. So part of our job is to provide the plumbing to enable you guys to do your job. And from a creative intent, from a producer's perspective, hey, you know, if you allow them, hey, I'll stream 4K raw at 5.5 gig per second any day. But, but once it hit the consumer, you know it's not possible. So you, that's why there's a lot of compression, you know, from an editor perspective, you know, ProRes, um, you know, you guys are creative side, you know this. I've been on both sides of the fence. So how do we enable you guys to do your thing, but provide the best quality to the consumer? And it's, that's where the bridge of the gap is. And it's interesting, too, because I, I think I talked with each of you about this a little bit, is the difference between that sort of quality of the content that you're receiving and making sure that everything's in sync and that it looks the way it's supposed to on different devices. That also can be kind of separated from the original production value. So, like, we do have the ability to do things in high-def streaming and HDR. Sometimes that's the right choice for your content. Sometimes having something that's a little rougher around the edges and more unguarded is the right aesthetic choice, but you still want to make sure that it looks good on the, the, the consumer side. So it's kind of funny to have those two things happening simultaneously. Um, we have about five minutes left. I have more questions to ask, but I wanted to see if the audience had any questions first. You're just fixing your hat. <laughs> In the back. <laughs> Not really. Um, we're, I, I'd say we're not quite there yet. Um, I think that most of what we're doing is still a very sort of organic human reaction to things. Um, we're talking, we're doing some projects internally at ButcherBird to uh, test ways of pulling data from the chat feed and kind of visualizing it on screen and doing interesting things with it that way. And I think there's a lot to be said kind of in that direction. I'm not entirely sure what AI would help with until you're really getting into, this is just sort of data crunching, like millions and billions of pieces of data rather than hundreds of thousands. Um, yeah, so there's, AI is a pretty broad and deep, right? So I, I sit on the, the ETC panel and we're talking about AI, uh, machine learning. Right now, ETC is working with SIMTI to see from a legalization perspective who owned the content. Uh, for example, facial recognition, right, inside an image. If you deliver your content to, let's say, an engine on, on AWS or Azure or GCP or any one of the cloud service, but it doesn't matter. Now, once they process that, who owned the content? So how do you monetize the content? And going back to the creative people, the the actors, the actresses, and stuff like that, how is that gonna happen? So it's still the wild, wild west, right? Now, one of the projects I worked on is using AI to look at compression. 
in terms of the value of business delivering content from a video quality measurement, right? And how video quality delivery affect the user experience from a, uh, from a quality measurement, the MOS scores perspective. So we look at various compression from the encoders for live linear, but we also look at the transcoders. So let's say you want to create different rendition for the same assets for distribution globally, right? So you know, North America, NTSD, you go to Europe, you have PAL, and you have sub format underneath that. So how do we look at the Moscow in terms of delivering that? So we look at the compression, it's like, okay, if I'm, if I'm creating an H.264 uh, rendition, multiple renditions for you know, HDR 1080p and stuff like that, what are the implications? And if, as I'm going downstream through the, my supply chain, why is that score having a, a MOS score of 50, uh, 50 uh, you know, uh, percent score versus 70, you know, based on your metrics, right? So we look at that very closely, and then we go, we send it through, like, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Looker. Uh, it's a BI platform where we can go, hey, give me the top 10 offenders that give me the MOS scores of 60% and less, because we have to look at what is good enough to the consumer, right? So we do things like that, and then we find out, because if I'm enabling the broadcast channel to my syndication partner, then I'm liable for that station, and why is that bad? Because my syndication partner is gonna come back to me and ask me, hey, why is that that uh, 720 have a mass scores of 65%, where it should be 70% as you go downstream, right? So things like that we do look at, and we look at the compression, for, uh, and you know, transcoding, you know, we have a bunch of them, like Elemental, you have Vantage, you have, um, it, it's a handful of different applications that you support to do for delivery, right? So things like that, you know, we, we, pay, we do pay close attention to that because without the consumer, what's the point of delivering quality content to the consumer? Because the demand is from the consumer. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> I didn't know you had a name that. for that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question was uh, so you use Stanford Design Teaching to. Uh, in, in what context? Okay. And do we use Stanford Design Thinking in any of? Yeah, Design Thinking. So that's that's for me really is depends on the workflow too, right? So obviously the creative side, the you know the production side, you have to look at the the creative intent from the producer's perspective, but the content coming off the camera ultimately is based on how you're gonna go in and go and start cutting. Before it hit Hulu, the master's already been completed, right? So from a Hulu perspective, we create different rendition uh, within, so Hulu data center is at LA3 when I built it back, back in the days. So I have a 300 compute nodes that provide different, I, I go in, I look at the content, and if the content's bad, then I would go back to NBC or Fox at the time. It's a 50-50 venture. And we look at it, well, okay, why did you give me such a horrible format, right? So, so we, we try to standardize everything, and then obviously when we work with SMPT and other, organiz or other organization, we try to set standardization, right? Because if you think about it, whatever format they give you, if you send it to your transporting form, the compression that goes into it is not going to get better, it's going to get worse. So that's why it's important, that's why you have 4K, 6K, 8K, right? Because you, you give the editors the opportunity to, hey, you know, work with 60 frames, by the time it is going to be down to 30 frames. So the creative of that is always going to be at a higher level before, before the consumer. Because once it hits the consumer, it's all about the business value of, hey, do I have the pipe to deliver that, right? And you look at right now, right? You know, everybody's giving uh, uplift on their internet access the last couple, year and a half, right? Because they weren't, 
it wasn't available to them at the time. And when the pandemic hits, it's like, okay, you know what? Now I'm, I'm all telecommuters, which means I need more speed, more bandwidth uh, to enable the editors that are sitting remotely. Instead of sending content directly to their house, they can actually go log in to our edge nodes uh, and then process the dailies and then have another person in LA, New York, and like said, go in and collaborate on the same assets. And that's the enablement of that. And I think on that note, we're basically out of time. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on this panel. And uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the festival.